want to welcome you again to our Wednesday evening study. Thank you all for joining us. Welcome to Vanessa, Bertram, Surimurti, Mr. Rao, and of course our host today is Praveen. So um, we uh, will carry on with the series that Praveen started. So it's good that he can uh, go ahead and complete that. Uh, just wanted to mention that, just one announcement that is we started physical services uh, last Sunday. So we are hoping that we can keep it up. And uh, officially the, pan, the wave is over apparently. So um, uh, we will hope that we can now carry on for a longer stint. We have to make some adjustments due to the uh, technicality. So we'll keep you all informed as we proceed and uh, upgrade our uh, you know, technology. But for today, we want God's provision and blessings upon our study today. So let's uh, bow our heads and let me lead you in a prayer. Precious loving Father, we are so grateful that once again on an evening like this, we can come together and we are thankful that you give us the time and the desire to, to uh, join in. We thank you for this platform. We pray that everything goes well. And most of all, that you guide the study so that we are able to understand, learn, grow, uh, recognize the, uh, the beauty of the scriptures. So we ask that you will just um, help us, Father, with our discussions and interactions. We want to commit the study into your hands and we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 You can take it away. Just give me a single minute. Uh, let me set my screen here. Okay. Uh, good evening to you all, and you all know that we have started. Can you can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, you all know we have started the series on Apostle Paul. We studied his life, and then a theological theme. Uh, sorry, the lessons from the life of Apostle Paul, and then uh, theological themes. Uh, uh, that were introduced to us by Apostle Paul also, right? And today, uh, we are going to uh, study or discuss uh, about some of the interesting things Apostle Paul have done, uh, especially Apostle Paul and uh, Jesus. These are the only two people have done this. You might have already have seen uh, the topic uh, in the WhatsApp group that is Old Testament images developed by Paul. Jesus and Paul, they have used various Old Testament incidents and Old Testament scriptures as parables in order to explain some theological points. In other words, they, they have used certain uh, parts of the Old Testament scripture as some images that reveal greater truths in the New Covenant. So these images, of course, we cannot go too deep into these images and uh, uh, speculate on them. Uh, they, when they have used these images, they have used them only for a particular point and particular focus. And we also should be able to connect to that particular focus only. We cannot go and uh, take every minute details of these uh, images or these uh, scripture portions from the Old Testament and speculate from that. If you do that, we, we, there is a great possibility for us to be deviated from the main message uh, that uh, uh, Apostle or uh, Jesus, uh, they're trying to teach to us. So today, we, what we will do is we'll discuss about a few images which Apostle Paul used in order to bring some theological teachings out of them. And of course, there are many, but I have chosen few important images only. Okay. Uh, first of all, first, I would like to list out the images that we are going to discuss, and then we'll go, uh, we'll continue with the, 
uh, discussion on those images. The first image is Adam and Jesus, the last Adam. He used this image of first Adam and the last Adam. And another image Apostle Paul used is Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve, he connected them to Christ and the church. And then third uh, image is Abraham, the life of Abraham. And he brought uh, a teaching called justification by faith. And then Abraham, and he used it uh, uh, for sanctification. Or, or He used Abraham and then to uh, speak about the unity of entire humanity. And then he used another picture or image that is Sarah and Hagar. And in order to explain about the true children of God and the sons of the covenant and sons of the bondage. And another uh, image Apostle Paul used was Moses. As Moses uh, had conversation with God and was walking down, uh, climbing down from the hill, his face was glowing. So he had to cover his face with a veil. Apostle Paul used that in order to bring some theological uh, teachings out of that. And lastly, we'll be discussing about Jacob and Esau, through which Apostle Paul discussed about the divine election. So these are the uh, important images we can find uh, from Apostle Paul's teaching in his uh, um, epistles, as well as uh, in Book of Acts. The first one, Adam and Christ. Adam is the first uh, Adam, the man who was created. And Christ, the Apostle Paul explains him as the last Adam. Because Apostle Paul wanted to bring what happened in Adam and compare the same uh, with Jesus. We can find that in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 21 to 22. Here, there it is written, For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. This is an analogy Apostle Paul is using. When, when Adam committed sin, entire humanity, uh, they have committed sin, they fell into uh, sin. And uh, then when Jesus rose again from the dead, all humanity also rose again from the dead. Here we can understand uh, especially two major point theological themes from this. Number one is vicarious nature of incarnation. In Adam, entire humanity died, where Adam acts as the federal head of entire humanity. Whatever happened to Adam happened to humanity. When Adam committed sin, Entire humanity committed sin. Even if you, to understand this, we always use the biological example. Where were we before our birth? We all were in the flesh of Adam. We all came from Adam. There is no man who, came, who did not come out of Adam. So all of us were in Adam. So Adam acts as the federal head of entire humanity. Apostle Paul uses the same uh, truth, same reality, and applies it to Jesus' incarnation. In Jesus, all humanity died, buried, and resurrected from the dead. That does not mean all humanity is saved. Please don't misunderstand. That is not what am I? What I am trying to say. But why here? Our focus should be: Jesus is acting as our federal head. So when Adam died, entire humanity died. When Jesus died, entire humanity died. When Adam committed sin, entire humanity committed sin. When Jesus rose again from the dead, entire humanity was justified. So this is the theme Apostle Paul is bringing. This is talking about the vicarious nature of uh, incarnation of Jesus Christ. And another important 
theological theme we find from this analogy or from this uh, image is uh, efficacy of Christ's atonement. There are a lot of people who, who say Christ died only for Christians. Have you heard? They may not be using the exact terms, but the people say Christ died only for the elect, not for the all. And this particular theological theme is called, uh, theological teaching is called limited atonement theory. Christ did not die for every, everyone, all humanity. Christ died for the people whom he has elected before the foundation of the world. He died only for them. And he and he say uh, and he and they say Christ already knows who are going to believe in him, and whoever 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 uh, whoever will accept Jesus in faith, he already knows since he according to his list only he elected people. He knows who will believe in him, so he elected them only. So there is no and they say there is no participation of man in the election of God in the salvation of humanity. Kindly don't misunderstand. I'm not saying there is no part. I truly say that we, we humans, we don't have any part in our salvation. We have only participation. Jesus has accomplished everything and we participate with him. And uh, uh, so here they talk about the efficacy of Jesus. For the people who speak about limited atonement theory, um, the effect of Adam's fall is much powerful than effect of Jesus' resurrection. In they are comfortable accepting all humanity that for have sinned in Adam. In one man, entire humanity can be sinned and become unrighteous, and uh, they become cursed. But in 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 the act of Jesus, they cannot accept entire humanity can be forgiven. Okay. So uh, this, for these people, uh, the efficacy of Adam's sin is more than the efficacy of Christ's atonement. But the reality is, the answer is which uh, based on the theme we discussed before. Adam is acting as a federal head for humanity. And when Adam committed sin, all committed sin in his fall. And Jesus is acting as a federal head. That's why when Jesus died, we, we died. When Jesus rose again from dead, we rose again from the dead. When he, uh, we are seated in the heavenly places. And we can find tons of scriptures, hundreds of scriptures in our New Testament teaching about this. Apostle Paul said several times, I was crucified with Christ, buried with Christ, rose again from dead with Christ. And in First Corinthians chapter, Second Corinthians chapter 15, we read, <coughs> if one man died, then all died. Very clearly has it, it, it's written. And we are, we are being seated in the heavenly places. That's what Apostle Paul say. So all these things were developed by Apostle Paul. And he has explained them using this particular analogy of Adam and the last Adam. And um, there, is, there is another, say, just as, only for the sake of clarification, I'm using that is in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 45, where it is written, the first man, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. Uh, reading these words out of context, many say that it is talking about Sabellianism, which means a father became son, son became the Holy Spirit. But these words is not talking about it because when we read about this image and analogy, uh, we may come across this word. That's why just I'm bringing, bringing a caution. This words is not talking about Sabellianism, where Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, they became one. Uh, like there are no three persons, but there is only one person. Father only became Son. They changed the names and the roles. That's what Sabellianism say. So it is not talking about it because we always need to understand this scripture in their very context. In the, the context of this particular scripture is about resurrection. And here, Apostle Paul uses this analogy again about uh, sp speaking about uh, resurrection. Adam, the man, the man Adam, he was representing the nat physical nature of humanity and the life-giving spirit, the last Adam, it is speaking about the spiritual nature of uh, humanity. And in fact, the spiritual nature of Jesus that had been given to us. 
okay and then apostle paul created a uh, you know unique and uh, revolutionary term in a term that is spiritual bodies the word body itself talking about physical things spiritual spirit and all we don't have bodies but through this analogy he uses a unique word that is about spiritual body so uh, my topic is not about i'm not talking about resurrection but i just wanted to caution you that this is not talking about sabellianism but it is about resurrection so first adam last adam they do speak about two themes number one is vicarious nature of christ incarnation number two is efficacy of christ atonement and the next image uh, paul brings is uh, adam and eve and he compares this uh, image with christ and the church if we can find this in ephesians chapter 5 verse 28 to 32 here it's written so husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies he who loves his wife loves himself for no one ever hated his own flesh but nourishes and cherishes it just as the lord does the does the church for we are the members of the members of his body of his flesh and bones for this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and the two shall become one flesh this is the great mystery but i speak concerning christ and the church here he is talking about adam and eve and the marriage where a man shall leave his father and mother and join to his wife and they shall become one flesh and he says this particular verse we can find in genesis which is talking about adam and eve which is talking about um, uh, marriage of course and he take this image and develops it and says this particular image is talking about god's eternal plan what is the eternal plan of god to bring humanity and the divinity together in his son jesus christ it is about the union the divine with the union god is bringing god uh, between humanity and divinity through his jesus christ in uh, in his in the in his incarnation that's why apostle paul wrote but i speak concerning christ and the church this union is about the union between christ and the church while you, while we are reading this this is quite interesting the language apostle paul uses also he is he is using same language which moses used and first thing he says is uh, uh, for we are the members of his body of his flesh and bones look at these words we are flesh and uh, flesh of jesus we are bones of jesus who said these words adam said when god created uh, eve and uh, and brought eve before adam the words adam said to eve is you are flesh of my flesh and bone of my bone and that's why you shall be called eve right and the same language apostle paul is bringing here we are the flesh of jesus christ we are the bones of jesus christ and he said we are the body of jesus about this we have already discussed how jesus paul said how we became the body of jesus how he realized it okay and uh, so it is talking about the great union between hum humanity and uh, divinity and one interesting thing here we can see is uh, a man shall leave his father and mother and joins to his wife and they shall become one flesh in the culture of moses not even the culture of paul no man leaves his family and goes to his wife and where they become one family in every culture in the world the girl and the woman they leave their family and go to husband's house and they live there and they shall become one flesh while moses is writing he is writing completely against his own culture if the elders of his culture comes and reads and uh, the books just consider he is giving a constitution to his people where he wrote this and elders of his elders are there uh, for uh, uh, discussion about the constitution what would they say they won't accept <coughs> but here moses have written and apostle paul also have written something completely opposite uh, to their culture it is because they have realized 
the great uh, truth about God and humanity. They understood this is not something uh, about just a marriage, but it is something, a, a revelation that God placed in their hearts. That is the reason purposefully they have written these words, which are, which are completely against their culture. Have we ever left anything and followed Jesus? We say, you know, no turning back, no turning back. The world is before me. The, I said the, the world is behind me. The cross before me. No turning back, no turning back. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. Have we ever left anything and followed Jesus? No. This is Jesus who left everything. He left the glory and came down to earth. And uh, so that he may join us. So here the man, the husband, he is leaving everything and joining us. And we are becoming one with him, the union. This is the only marriage in the world where the groom is leaving everything and coming and joining his bride. In all the cultures, bride leaves everything and joins to her husband. But here in this particular union, the groom left everything and joined us. So it is not we sought him. He sought us. He came seeking and saving it is to seek and save us. And Apostle, as Apostle Paul wrote in Romans chapter 3, there is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands. And there is no one who seek God. So God, he sought us. So this is an image that Apostle Paul is bringing. Of course, we can, if you want to study, there is even greater truth we can study within the frame. Apostle Paul used uh, this particular image. And then another image Apostle Paul used is Abraham. And he used it for justification. And it is again uh, talking about just, uh, uh, there is no justification for humanity by our works. In other words, no humanity can be justified in the sight of the Lord by our works. In order to re very strongly teach this, in fact, he is the only person who brought this particular concept of concept called justification by faith. And nobody developed those, nobody spoke on those. Apostle Paul developed it. And um, uh, because he is the one who is reading the scripture very much. And let me tell you, uh, do you know what is the most repeated word in book of Romans and Corinthians? Have you ever read? I mean, have you ever seen? The most repeated word in book of Romans and Corinthians is, as it is written. So many Old Testament scriptures he was quoting. <coughs> so justification by faith is also an Old Testament concept, which Apostle Paul noticed and brought it and has presented it in the light of the incarnation of Jesus Christ. And he brought the doctrine of justification to us. Romans chapter 4, verse 1 to 4. What then shall we say that Abraham, our father, has found according to the flesh? According to the flesh means according to the works of the flesh, according to the obedience towards the law. For if Abraham was justi justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Now to him who works, the wages are not counted as grace, but debt. So justification by faith is an Old Testament concept which Apostle Paul brought. Abraham believed in God and it, has, it was counted to him as righteousness. In the same way we believe in Jesus and God is going to give us the same righteousness to us. And if we think we are going to attain the justification by obeying the law and commandments, and that is not the grace, but God is in debt of us. <laughs> okay. So uh, it, is, it is completely grace of God by which Abraham saved in the same manner. We all are going to be justified and made righteous. And uh, circumcision is a, just a sign of justification, but it is not means of justification. Nobody will be justified or no circumcision or, or obey obedience of the law, obedience to the law. Nobody will be justified by doing any of those. In, entire humanity can be will be justified only by faith 
in Jesus or faith of Jesus Christ. So through this analogy, Apostle Paul is bringing justification by faith. And second thing is through this analogy only, he started teaching salvation is not only for Jews, it is for entire humanity who believe. It is for all. Salvation is not for Jews only. Uh, if it is, if, uh, if it is, uh, if Abraham is justified by obedience uh, of the law or by circumcision, then the salvation would have been reserved only for a community of people. But the Abraham believed in God and that was counted him as righteousness because of that very reason, all of us who are believing in him are able to experience or receive the salvation God is prepared for us. And the next is Sarah and Hagar. The true children of God are the children of faith. Romans chapter 9, verse 8 to 9. Here it is written. That is, those who are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted as seed. For this is the word of promise. At this time I will come and Sarah shall have son. So here again, Apostle Paul is bringing this analogy. Uh, people who are born of the flesh, they are not the children of God, but people who are born of the promise, they are the children. He is using the same uh, example of Sarah and Hagar. Hagar's son, Ishmael, was a child of Abraham who was born of the flesh. And uh, the children of Israel, sorry, uh, Isaac, who was born because of the promise. And he says, all those who are born of the flesh cannot be considered as uh, children of God, but who those who are born of the promise are considered the children of God. And the context Apostle Paul is writing here is with Jewish people. And here he is using, he is considering the Jews who rejected Jesus as children who are born of the flesh. And those who put their faith in Jesus Christ, them he is considering as children of promise. Somebody who is who is born to born in a Jewish family, they are not going to become the children of God. Those who put their faith in Jesus, they only will become the children of God. As the scripture says, whosoever believeth in him, he had given the right to become the children of God. John chapter 1 verse 12. So he is using this analogy again um, in comparison with the Jews who did not, who are not believing in Jesus, and uh, he brings forth the theme saying, "Children of promise are the true children of two true heirs of God." The same thing Apostle Paul wrote in Galatians chapter three, verse twenty-six. Here he says, "For you are all sons of God through faith in Jesus Christ." Who have put their faith in Jesus Christ, they are the sons of God, not just <clears throat> the people who are born uh, to a particular community. And he again, he uses the same um, image, Sarah and Hagar, to bring another theological um, uh, theme, and he develops the theme of about two covenants. The, there are two covenants, old covenant and the New covenant. The old covenant is about the law and the commandments, the circumcision, Sabbath, or whatever we are, we are talking about, and the new covenant that is in Jesus Christ. And in the early church, there are people who were teaching the Gentile Christians how to follow the old commandment also, or sorry, old covenant also, which is the law and circumcision and all those. For them, he is writing. And he says, Galatians chapter 4, verse 21 onwards. Tell me, you who desire to be under the law, do you not hear the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by the bond woman, the other by free woman. But he who was of the bond woman was born according to the flesh, and he of the free woman through promise. Which, uh, sorry, which things are symbolic? That's a, that is a, this is where our theme we have taken. These are Old Testament images. These are symbolic. That's how personal policies. For these are the two covenants. 
the one from Mount Sinai, which gives birth to bondage. What came from Mount Sinai? <coughs> the Ten Commandments and the law. That came from Mount Sinai. What came from Mount Sinai, which gives birth to bondage, not for freedom? And what is there again on Mount Sinai? And this is one of the important uh, places for our, uh, you know, the, uh, the other community of people from whom, uh, from Ishmael, right? For them, Mount Sinai is one of the holy places. Uh, this Mount Sinai is talking about Hagar. For this Hagar, uh, sorry, the one from Mount Sinai which gives birth to bondage, which is Hagar. For this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia. It is symbolizing the communities that came from Ishmael. And corresponding, corresponds to Jerusalem, which now is and is in bondage with her children, but the Jerusalem above is free, which is the mother of all of us. For it is re written, Rejoice, O barren, you who do not bear. I break forth and shout, you who are not in labor. For the desolate has many more children than she who has husband. Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are children of promise. And he says, the children, Isaac and our Jerusalem, these are the children of promise. They are of uh, free women. These are of new covenant. And he tells us, now we are the children. We are symbolizing. We are, uh, sorry, we are like the children of Isaac. He said, now we, brethren, as Isaac was, the children of promise, ch children of freedom, are children of promise. But as he who was born according to the flesh, then persecuted him who was, are born according to the spirit even so it is now nevertheless what does the scripture say cast out the bond woman and her son for the son of the bond woman shall not be there uh, shall not be here, here uh, with the son of the free woman so brethren we are not children of bond women but of free people who are accepting the in simple words accepting the new covenant are the ch people children of the free women are the children of the covenant and people who are of the law are considered as uh, children of bondage. And to an extent, the children of bondage, people of the law have, uh, they tried to uh, suppress the people of the covenant, especially in the book of, uh, sorry, in the first century, we see the Jewish Christians, certain kind of Jewish Christians, they were trying to, uh, impose more and more laws upon uh, Gentile Christians and we're troubling them. And to them, he is speaking. You are of children of faith, children of the new covenant. Those are of children of the old covenant. Those are of bondage. Then in Christ, we are children of freedom. So we are called to live in the freedom that Christ has prepared for us. For liberty, Christ has set us free. And we are not to go under the yoke of the old covenant or yoke of the old <coughs> or old uh, uh, testament law and we are we are called to live in the newness of life by the spirit of uh, spirit of jesus christ so here he is explaining again if you if, let me tell you in simple words if we try to be uh, if we feel that we will be the true children of god if we obey the law then we are in the blindness. We are in blindness and ignorance. If we try to live according to the law, then we are the children of bondage, according to Apostle Paul. And if we try to live by the newness of the spirit in Jesus Christ, in the new covenant, then we are the children of freedom, the promised children, and the new covenant, children of God. <coughs> <coughs> And second last uh, image I would like to bring before you is Jacob and Esau. It is talking about election. Romans chapter 9, verse 9 to 13. Here Apostle Paul says, And not only this, but the Rebekah also had conceived by one man, even by our father Isaac. For the children are yet uh, children not yet 
being born, nor having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of the works, but of him who calls. It was said to her, the older shall serve the younger, as it is written, Jacob I have loved, but Ishab I have hated. So here, Apostle Paul is the first person again who is talking about the divine election. All these are very new concepts and the, the, the theology of Apostle Paul brought is quite unique and he contributed a lot to Christian understanding of God and Christian theology and doctrine. Uh, he say he, the very topic of election was brought by him. And he says, uh, in, in these words, he always, he, he says a great theme, the uh, sorry, great teaching that is, God has elected without, uh, even before anybody have done any good or bad. God did not choose you and me because we are obedient to him or we are religious to him or uh, we are uh, uh, good people. God elected even before we ever, ever born, before we have done anything. That's the same thing Apostle Paul writes in Ephesians also. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 3 to 6. Blessed be the God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with every spiritual blessings just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. Here also it is written uh, 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 for the children not yet, born, not yet being born, not having done any good or evil, the purpose of God according to the election might stand, not of works, but of him who calls. According to his purpose, not by any of our works, God has chosen. And he said, Jacob I have loved and Isha I, ha I, I have hated. So this is uh, uh, you and I. So I would like to tell you, you and I are elected not because of our religiosity, not because of our education or goodness, or because of we are interested in reading Bible or any magazine. You and I are elected just out of sheer grace of God, even we have before we have ever done anything. It's all the grace of God. So that's what, that is what Apostle Paul explains through the election of Jacob and Isha. One statement uh, which he wrote and many people ask, why is it written? Jake, uh, that is, Jacob I have loved, but Isha I have hated. Does God hate people? This is, uh, this is, uh, these are certain kind of statements which are uh, uh, used, exaggeration sometimes. We use, uh, that is a writing form, exaggeration. So this is a form of those days writing also. Uh, Jacob I have loved and Isha I hated. It doesn't mean God hated. God is love and he always loves. God, Jesus, or God, who told us to love his enemies, sorry, love our, love our enemies, do you really think that he would hate, you know, his own creation, Isha? It is just an exaggeration, but it is not talking about God being hating somebody. And some group of people say that God elected somebody, those are the people who him he loved, and God did not elect some people, those are the people whom God did not uh, love. That is also not true. In the reality, when God, uh, regarding the predestination, God did not elect you and me also. God elected only one person. That is Jesus. God elected Jesus and he wanted to accomplish everything in Jesus. That is what it is written in Colossians. All things are created in him, through him, for him and by him and it pleased the Father to all things should consist in him. And to reconcile everything through him. So God did not elect you and me personally. God elected Jesus. In Jesus, you and I all have been chosen. So uh, here Apostle Paul is speaking about election and he tells two things. Number one, we, you and I are elected. We are brought into the kingdom of God by sheer grace of God. Not because of any of our works. And number two, God's election, in God's election, God elected Jesus and in him, our entire humanity has been elected and there is no distinction that God has shown or there, there is no uh, what, partiality that God has shown. God's election is not the rejection of somebody else. And uh, if you read the same chapter, Romans chapter 9, verse uh, uh, 9 to 13, uh, read the context, we understand. But he elected not just simply 
he elected according to his purpose. So this election is particularly for a purpose. So that from which we understand his election is not rejection of others. His election of somebody is for a particular purpose. Just we are these many people at the end of the service, we ask people, we pick somebody and ask them to pray. We elected them. That does not mean we rejected the remaining. Okay. So that's all that we need to keep it at that. And the last image I would like to bring before you is Moses and Jesus. In 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 12 to 18, it is written, Therefore, since we have such hope, we use great boldness of speech, unlike Moses, who put a veil over his face so that the children of Israel do, could not look steadily at the end, uh, end of what was passing away. But their minds were blinded. For until this day, the same veil remains unlifted in the reading of the Old Testament because the veil is taken away in Christ. But even to this day, when Moses read, the veil lies on their hearts. Nevertheless, when one turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror, the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. Number one thing is, when G Moses went onto the Sinai mountain and received the law, he was in the presence of God. His face was glowing with the glory of God. As much as he focused on God, he was reflecting the glory of God, just like the mirror. And in last words, he says, as much as we look unto Jesus, we will be transformed into his image. Okay. Uh, it said, uh, you know, uh, with unveiled face, beholding as in the mirror, the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same. So as much as we look unto Jesus, we will be transformed into his image. Uh, so that is one thing Paul, Apostle Paul is bringing from uh, from this. So when Moses looked unto God, his face was glowing. And the same way when we look unto God, we become like Christ, number one. And number two thing, in the Old Testament, where when, when uh, Moses came down bringing the law, there is always a veil. So if you try to understand God or try to reach God, there is always there is an obst obstruction. Only in Jesus we can come to the Father. No one can come to the Father except through Jesus, not even through the law. So even if we, we the moment we go through the law, we according to what Paul said, there will be an obstruction. That is like uh, he said um, in the reading of the Old Testament. Sorry, uh, for until this day, the same veil remains un the veil, same veil remains unlifted in the reading of the Old Testament. The moment we go to the law, it comes. That's what uh, uh, Paul is writing about. So these are some of the images we can see from the writings of Paul, which he has taken from Old Testament. They're beautiful. Some of them are very uh, important for Christian theology. So I would like to leave it at this and so that we can uh, have our discussion. Uh, if you have any questions or if you want to make any comments, uh, feel free to uh, do that. Okay, the floor is open. So anyone have any thoughts that you want to share? Uh, yes, Surimati, go ahead. What? Uh, do Unmute. yourself and before you speak, thank you. Jacob have a love. And Yusu have a hatred. Um, I think some translations say loved less. Yusu have a loved less, not hated. But again, the thing is that 
why God should love somebody or hate somebody even before he is born? Have I made myself clear? Is my voice coming? Yes, yes, sir. We could, we could understand what you're saying. The same thing I addressed also. Many people say that God hated uh, Jacob or loving less. Both are, uh, uh, you know, similar. There is nothing, <laughs> there is nothing to, uh, no much difference between both of them. The reality is those are exaggerations. Yeah, even right. then, that even the then, idea. even then, why God should decide in advance, even before the birth? That is what it is, I mentioned, sir. According to his purpose, he has a purpose. And he accomplished. His purpose is not for Jacob. His purpose is for entire humanity. Just as his, his purpose was not just for uh, the, for Abraham. Hello, his purpose His purpose is for entire humanity. So through him, all generations may be blessed. So this is the same thing carrying for being carried forward in uh, Jacob's anyway, generation. Anyway, whenever we read the scripture, the particular scripture, uh, at least I find it uh, difficult to stomach. Why God should do that? And uh, you said Paul's uh, images are similar to Jesus' Jesus parables. Am I right? Have I... I didn't. I I said just like Jesus, he's using he's he's using certain Old Testament situations, Old Testament uh, scriptures as parables. That's what I said. Anyhow. We used to believe in the WCG, World Wide Church of God. Jesus said parables to hide the meaning, not to reveal the meaning. I do not know what is the present understanding. So if you look at that understanding, and if you read Paul's images, Paul's images are also not very revealing. It's only confusing. Also, uh, Paul's writings are difficult. That's what Peter also says. So the images are not making things clear, but uh, making some confusion. That is what I understand. Okay. Yeah. Uh, one thing is for sure, uh, Jesus used parables not just to uh, hide the meaning. If it, if you be, For better, for Jesus, instead of hiding the meaning, don't tell anything. Leave the people in ignorance, right? There is no point in uh, taking some example and hide a meaning. You can just ignore it. So that is something that's, that, that is, but that particular thing is misunderstanding of uh, a particular scripture for which, uh, about which we can have um, a be better discussion with a proper study for sure. And uh, uh, definitely understanding the images Paul brings is not that easy, but at the same time, uh, once we started seeing through his perspective, they will be very much helpful. And the Peter who said the writings of uh, Peter, Paul are difficult, the same one, in the next verse he says, read him. And first verse he says he appreciates. Okay. So, yeah. Vanessa. Uh, okay, what I want to say is that through faith we have salvation and also that our sins are forgiven. So now at the end time, supposing we have sinned, but we have faith we are going to be uh, saved. Oh, then people will say that we are going to be saved because we have faith, so then we'll keep sinning. So, 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 how can how can the how can the salvation take place when we have faith and plus we are sinning also? Yeah, uh, I would like to ask you to read Romans chapter six and seven until eight. These three chapters they deal particularly about uh, uh, these matters. Okay, so we are the uh, we are we are people who are saved, uh, and uh, we are people given the grace to overcome sin. That is for sure. We are people who are called to live away from sin. That is for sure. And uh, let me let me ask you this uh, 
uh, Vanessa, can any of us, can any of us live without sinning? No. No. If we are not able to live, we are not able to live without sin. That's why Jesus came and died for us. And uh, if we are able to live without sin, then Christ died for nothing. That is number one. Number two thing, uh, Titus chapter, chapter 2, verse 11 to 13, it says, The grace of God which brought salvation to us, it teaches us to live righteously, soberly, and it makes us jealous to do all good works. So the grace of God, it is going to make us righteous and jealous for good works. So a person who is truly transformed by the Spirit of God, who is truly saved, that person, uh, the Spirit is going to work in them to overcome sin, to avoid sin, to uh, to do good works, which God has already prepared. That is the Bible. That's what Bible says. And in fact, you are asking this question because you want to do good. You don't want to do sin. It is because you are saved by the Spirit of God. Yes, sir. The question which uh, Vanessa has asked is the same question as asked by, I think, by Paul in one of the scriptures which I cannot recollect. Romans 7. Uh, Roman 7. He asked the same question and he says, certainly not. After the question, he says, certainly not. That is, certainly you are not going to sin. Yeah, the same thing we are saying. Certainly you cannot continue in sin. But it, this is not as like, you know, I I, de I determined I, I can accomplish. It is completely by God's grace. And uh, uh, we get the desires to be do good. It's because of the grace of God. That's why we don't want to do sin. That's why we are scared also <laughs> that we may go and sin. So be assured the spirit who is working in you and uh, he is going to keep you safe. Be assured of that. Bharti. Uh, uh, right, uh, Praveen. <laughs> Very true. We are saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. And not of ourselves, it is the gift of God. And not of works, lest any man boast. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works. Uh, true. With the Holy Spirit in us, uh, which God has blessed us with, um, it plays God is, um, uh, you know, joined to Christ, even His flesh and bones. You know, we all are children. And is it uh, transforms us. It transforms our heart. Transforms us. Uh, just very now, just about since a day or so, uh, I've been having these thoughts. You know. Uh, uh, I'll tell you frankly, just turning away from the church, you know. I just let me be just uh, true to you, you know, envious and turning away, resentful. All these things have been this thing. And then I realized, then I realized, Lord, I, uh, you know, uh, I need to be reading the word, you know, to God says, God's help is there. And, um, and then I, and I, I've been lacking the, you know, I need to read more. I need to read, uh, receive the word of God speaking to my heart. And I need more of Christness to, to, uh, to uh, you know, to fight this and uh, not to give in to this. And this is absolutely not the way. And it is, uh, so the Lord has told us uh, to, uh, to look to Christ and let his word dwell richly in our heart. Let the peace of God rule our hearts. And so many other scriptures. Comforting, strengthening. That's why the Holy Spirit in us, which, uh, the Christ promise given to us, the Holy Spirit. His Spirit is a helper, a guide, a, a comforter, and a counselor. And so we have the help of uh, Christ's uh, Spirit. We have the help of the Holy Spirit. Uh, enabling us, empowering us, and uh, even uh, inspiring us. You know, as you say, good fruit. Born. 
by the grace of God. Yes, by the grace. We, none of us really qualifies. It is God who qualifies us. And through Christ, rightly said, we are saved through faith in Christ. By grace, through faith in Christ. And uh, Christ alone is our salvation. And just mentioned the grace of God which brings salvation. It's true. Christ is with us. And I I just, um, I what to call the encourage Vanessa and uh, even uh, uh, Suramuthi, you know, old friends, you know, Suramuthi and I, uh, to hold on, you know, to trust the Lord, you know, to do the work, to do his working. In my prayers now, I said, Lord, help me to have regard for your working, your operation in my life and others of our, of our lives. And also help me to re, uh, help me to declare your wonderful work. So, you know, if you read Psalms, very, very helpful to lift us up. Thanks uh, be to God. That's, uh, yeah, that's beautiful, uh, Bertie. Definitely the Spirit of God helps us. Avinas, I would like to encourage you to read Romans 6, 7, 8 primarily, and then the Book of Galatians. Book of Galatians is completely dealing with this particular matter only. And uh, where Apostle Paul asks directly one question, that is, uh, you, you who started in faith, will do you want to continue by works? And uh, if if righteousness the, can, be, can be achieved by the works of the law, then Christ died in vain. That's a very strong statement. So I would like to encourage you to go through uh, these two scripture portions which may help you more in understanding your question. Yes, to add to, uh, can I speak, uh, Pravin? Yes, please. Uh, uh, just to add to what you said, uh, I'll encourage, I would also encourage Vanessa, uh, quoting scripture that he who has begun a good work in you uh, uh, will complete it unto the day of Jesus Christ and may your whole body, spirit and soul uh, be uh, you know, kept be preserved blameless unto the day of Jesus Christ. You know, so God has begun a good work in us, will complete it, you know. Uh, it's all uh, all very, very, uh, you know, excellent things God has uh, promised and he tells us that how he is doing it, you know, in us. So this should encourage uh, Vanessa and uh, me, me and all of us, you know, that God has a work. They say he has an unfinished work in us, you know. And uh, he's, uh, yeah, he wants all of us to be conforming more and more to Christ. Thank you, Lord. Uh, Surya uh, Murthy, sir. Both, are, both of you were suggesting to Vanessa to read some chapters of Romans and Galatians. Uh, you are not able to hear me? Yes, I can hear you. I think Praveen is able, not able to hear. Uh, no, please, please go ahead. I'm able to listen to you. Uh, you, you. You people are suggesting to Vanessa to read certain chapters of from uh, Romans and Galatians. Uh, fine, that is a very good suggestion. But what I would like to say is that if she is going to read those chapters through KJV or NIV, she is going to find it very difficult. I would prefer her to read some translations like NLT. It is more or less accurate, but it is written in a very simple style. Or any other translation. She should, if she is going to read through KJV and NIV, it is going to be very difficult. Yeah. This is my view. Yeah. Okay, well, I think uh, we have more or less finished with our time, but uh, very interesting conversations. Uh, I really enjoyed uh, the interaction and, of course, uh, uh, what Praveen had uh, presented today. Uh, permit me to just close by making a few comments, uh, especially over the interaction you all had. Um, Suri Murthy brought up about Jacob and Esau, about um, Esau being hated and uh, Jacob being loved. I think um, the language used tends to, you know, uh, make us, or rather tends to give the impression that one is rejected. But that is what we have to be careful about. It's not a rejection. 
if you notice esau's life he was blessed as he lived his life he was blessed yes. and so it was not a rejection i think like praveen very rightly mentioned it was uh, uh, a purpose that god had had in mind that he would work through this particular individual that was elected and of course right down to you know even in beginning from abraham right down to jesus christ so if you look at it that way it might be just a little easier or more palatable as we read and secondly uh, venessa i mean it's an interesting question you brought up that uh, well we are under grace so we can go on sinning as much as we want uh, you know the the thought i'd like to just plant in your mind is um you know when you become a child of god you know in christ we become his children uh, our heavenly father is our father what i mean then to live your life as though you're not a child of god doesn't make any sense does it <laughs> how can we live a life like for example i am or uh, the son of my father who is zachariah now can i live my life as though i am not zachariah see that is the contradiction we bring by saying well because of grace i can do anything i want and keep sinning so i thought i'll just plant those thoughts <laughs> think about it but um uh, i think we should uh, add we should also make a note of uh, what surimurti said about parables uh hiding the meaning that was our old belief maybe we should do a study on that and maybe we can bring that as a stand alone sometime down the line we will make a note of these things and bring them in otherwise any final thoughts uh, otherwise thank you bertie for some of your uh, encouraging words thank you very much because it encourages us to see your uh, dedication uh, in spite of the road you've traveled the challenges you faced you you being faithful uh, is a is a tremendous inspiration for all of us too and thank you for that otherwise um, may i request suryamurthy if you can thank god for this time and uh, suryamurthy is uh, saying no okay <laughs> all right then uh, we we'll, can can we ask venessa if you can close in prayer is that okay thank you heavenly father lord god almighty lord jesus christ holy spirit we thank you for bringing us together today for a wonderful evening where we heard your word we are able to understand we are able to discuss and share our thoughts and and our difficulties and whatever we are feeling i thank you father for parveen for pastor and for all of us members who are here today and all who will also hear your word heavenly father lord god almighty we ask you to please help us during our days ahead and guide and direct us during the night in lord jesus christ your precious beloved son's name we pray amen amen and thank you thank you god bless you and we we'll look forward to seeing you again soon Thank you.